Hi, everyone, and thank you for attending this live virtual presentation of our Commonweal Conversations, Reimagining U.S. Catholicism Today. I'm Dominic Preziosi, editor of Commonweal. We hope you're well on this 12th of October, at a time when we'd ordinarily be gathering in person to present Commonweal's Catholic in the Public Square Award. Though we're disappointed in not being able to do so this year, we are nevertheless very excited that we can come together virtually this afternoon for the second in our four-part series of conversations with lay leaders on how U.S. Catholicism is being transformed by new kinds of leadership, learning, and institutional life. Welcome back to those of you who joined us last week for the first session that kicked off the series, Catholic Women in Church Leadership. The title of our panel today is Modern and Just Catholic Education and Formation. We'll hear more about the session and its participants in just a moment, but I also want to remind you that our programming will continue on each of the next two Mondays. On October 19th, we'll host a session entitled A Reckoning of Catholic Institutions, and on October 26th, we'll discuss the future of community and sacramental life. Uh, now remember that if you are registered uh, and you're here and registered for today's session, you've already registered for all four. And if you can't make it to all of our talks, you'll be able to find them on YouTube for viewing at your convenience. I also would like to uh, take a moment to mention our Catholic in the Public Square honorees, who have also very generously agreed to help host these virtual events. Last week, we were happy to have Carrie A. Robinson on hand. And today, we're proud to welcome our other honoree, Amy R. Goldman. Amy is CEO and chair of GHR Foundation, a global philanthropy of service to people and their limitless potential for good. She's also a member of foundations and donors interested in Catholic activities. Amy serves on the board of Georgetown University and the University of St. Thomas, as well as Opus Holding, the Visitation School, Jesuit Refugee Service International Development Group, Mayo Clinic Leadership Council, and she is also a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. In a moment, I'll be turning things over to Amy to introduce today's panel and participants. Uh, but first, I just want to offer this friendly reminder about our Commonweal events. They are free and open to the public, and they wouldn't be possible without our readers and subscribers. The support and encouragement we get from friends and readers of Commonweal are truly indispensable, especially at times like this. If our independent lay-run voice matters to you, we invite you to support us with a tax-deductible donation. Just see the donate link in the chat feature or go to our website. And if you don't do so already, please, continue, please consider subscribing to the magazine, join our email newsletter list, listen to our podcast, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Your help not only allows us to bring you events like these, but it's a big part in everything else we do. I also have to note the hard work of the staff here at Commonweal in helping put this series of events together, especially our audience development team, Milton Javier Bravo, Gabriella Wilkie, and Adriana Melnick, along with our publisher, Tom Baker. And I want to thank all of those who have agreed to take part, moderators and panelists, in this thoughtful and enlightening series of discussions. So now, without further ado, I hand things over to Amy Goldman. Thank you, Dominic, and hello, everyone. I'm grateful to be able to join you today, if virtually, for this important conversation, and kudos to Commonweal for putting on this fantastic series. I want to begin by thanking all the sponsors for this event for your support, and also thank all of our viewers for being here today. I truly hope we can gather for our Common Wheels 2021 conversation dinner. But today, we've come together for what's certain to be an enlightening panel, Modern and Just Catholic Education and Formation. It's intended to examine how educators and parents are being challenged to reimagine creative and just methods of learning that can meet the current and future needs of Catholic education and formation. As I reflect on the pressing new and enduring challenges our nation faces, economic and health crises, systemic racism, increased polarization, there's a critical role for the tenets of Catholic social teaching to play in preparing the future. I believe now more than ever, Catholic education has an accelerated need to reimagine how it might provide a solid moral foundation at greater scale and with increased accessibility. 
So leading us in this conversation today, we're so pleased to have today's moderator, Dr. Michael Papard, Professor of Theology at Fordham University. A teacher and a scholar, Dr. Papard's primary work brings to light the meanings of the New Testament and other Christian materials in their social, political, artistic, and ritual contexts. He received his PhD in Religious Studies from Yale University, with prior degrees from Yale Divinity School, its Institute of Sacred Music, and the University of Notre Dame. He frequently offers commentary on current affairs at the nexus of religion, politics, and culture for Commonweal, and the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, and PBS. So thank you all once again for being here today, and I'll turn it over to you now, Michael. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really thrilled to be moderating this discussion and I wanna get quickly to the brilliant insights of the panelists. Um, and I, I'd like to start if we could with, with Molly. So Molly Wilson O'Reilly is editor at large at Commonweal and she is also a columnist. And, and Molly, as we, as we think about the different phases of education, I think about the fact that like so many parents of school age kids across the country, for many months, you've been managing a three ring circus at your house, um, in your case, four ring circus. Uh, and you wrote, uh, you wrote about this in Commonweal last week. You wrote about the return of your children to their Catholic school. Um, but you wrote that you don't want this to be held up um, as a false contrast to supposed failures of public education. And let me read a quote. You said, quote, Catholics should be standing in solidarity with all our neighbors as we do our best to cope with this crisis. We degrade our witness when we allow Catholic schools to be used in a propaganda campaign against public services or against an honest reckoning with the facts. So now as someone with both on the ground experience and a bird's eye view of Catholic education as an editor of Commonweal, um, what do you think are the ways that Catholic schools can respond to today's unique challenges? Thanks, Michael. So, yeah, my perspective uh, at this moment is very much that of an elementary school parent um, and also graduate. I, mean, I went to, to Catholic elementary school myself. Um, and so I'm very grateful to be able to say that all, for the first time, all of my kids are in school at the same time together all day. Um, and their Catholic elementary school is able to do that, uh, as I wrote in that column, both because it has the space and the small enough class size and because it has the very dedicated principal and faculty um, who are making it work. Um, but also because private schools don't have a lot of the concerns that, that uh, public schools do. And it's really important to keep that in mind um, that that's, it's not a one-to-one -one comparison at all. So when it came to choosing Catholic schools for our kids, um, my husband and I, really wanted them to have the experience of community, of, of being raised in a community of faith and also um, community minded. And that was something that we both felt like we took away from our own experience of Catholic school. Um, and I think that that's the real treasure that Catholic grade schools have in all of their various circumstances because they are so different depending on where they are and who their students are, but they all have a mission to build community and to teach not just the fundamentals of the faith, but also what it looks like to live that in an everyday context. Um, because the very project of making a Catholic school work with all of the creativity that it takes and all of the sacrifice and the hustle that it involves is a community building project that it, it requires sacrifices from everyone, investment from everyone. And then because it's based in the faith, it gives a, a common ground to unite and inspire at its best. Um, and so I know at my kids school, the, the principal and the teachers and also the curriculum itself keeps calling the students to look around them and see the problems in the world and the problems in their community and ask what they can do to respond and how they can use the education that they're getting to respond um, now and also in the future. So I think that's the big challenge of this moment um, for all of us and especially for schools is perceiving and being aware of the challenges that everyone's experiencing, especially because this pandemic has been a challenge to so many different groups of people in so many different ways all at the same time. Um, and what schools have to ask and what Catholic schools especially have to ask is, are we forming students in a way that makes them conscious of their neighbors and makes them seek to 
be of service in their community or are we teaching them to think of themselves as set apart and superior and um, even embattled because solidarity is a core catholic value and solidarity can be really threatened by instability which is something that we're seeing play out in so many ways in our political context right now you know and so for catholic schools um, the New York Archdiocese has been held up as a success story, but at the same time, 20 Catholic schools in the New York Archdiocese closed for good in June. Um, and the rest are scrambling to be on a solid financial footing, even more than usual. And any Catholic school parent knows that they always are. So my concern is that that need for funding and that longing for stability will tempt Catholic school communities to play into that boo to the public schools framework that the New York Post, for example, is always pushing. Um, because whatever Catholic schools mission is, they're not supposed to be a replacement for public schools. That isn't what they're intended to do. And so if advocating for funding for Catholic schools means advocating for even less adequate funding for public schools, then that's a real failure of the solidarity that we're supposed to be representing. So I think Catholic schools have a unique set of gifts that they can bring to the challenges of this moment in terms of educating kids for community and also keeping them safe. But they also really need to work to make sure that they're educating children in a way that demonstrates concern for the common good and, and solidarity instead of encouraging them to pull away. Thank you so much for introducing a lot of a lot of important issues there about access to education, about the, the value, the virtue of solidarity, which may stand in tension with pursuits of excellence and, uh, as you say, superiority in some cases. Um, I think we'll return to a number of these issues throughout the hour, and uh, we'll come back to you, Molly, when when those come up again. I, I want to turn next to uh, Hasman Ospino, who is a professor of Hispanic Ministry and Religious Education at Boston College School of Theology and Ministry. And um, I won't read everyone's full bio because they're provided there in the chat for you, but uh, you, can, you can check those out uh, as you want. And, and Professor Ospino, you know, you've done extensive research on curriculum of Catholic education in general, and you've also had a special emphasis on Hispanic and Latino Catholics. And I'm curious, um, as you see things from your perspective, what are the challenges that we face in providing an education that is, that is just, that is distinctive, that is truth-telling, that is oriented toward discipleship. Uh, and I'm also curious, I guess, at part B, as, as someone who speaks regularly to both English and Spanish-speaking church cultures, uh, I'm wondering in what ways your answers to such questions depend on the audience uh, that, that you engage with. Thank you, Michael, for, uh, uh, for that question. and. Uh... I mean, it's a pleasure also to be part of this uh, dialogue, you know, alongside with uh, Molly, Cecilia, and Elsie, and th definitely you. Uh, I mean, Molly certainly provided me with uh, a number of ideas that I, I hope that we get to, to discuss down the road, you know, during this hour. But let me get to, to, to your question. I think that the, it is imperative, you know, that we uh, remember why we have Catholic educational institutions. At the, at, the end, at the end of the day, that's the core question. You know? If we're gonna be in the business of Catholic schools, in the business of Catholic uh, universities, we need to understand you know, wh why, why we have it. You know? And uh, Catholic education is ultimately a ministry of the church, meaning a ministry of the community of disciples of Jesus Christ, you know, rooted in the gospel, in the wisdom of the gospel, you know? So if that's the starting point, you know, I think that, you know, any attempt to co-opt uh, or to manipulate what we do and how we do Catholic education, you know, needs to be placed in check. Catholic schools in this country, in the United States of America, um, and, you know, and not only in the United States, all throughout the world, you know, have been established primarily with uh, two main purposes. You know, when we go back to the Third Plenary Council of Baltimore, you know, that pretty much mandated or asked every parish to establish a Catholic school, you know, it was very clear what, why we were to have uh, Catholic schools. And eventually, you know, this echoed how we ended up with so many Catholic universities and institutes and so on, you know. 
Reason number one, we wanted to give children, our Catholic children, primarily our Catholic families, the best possible education available, no? And uh, at the time when many Catholic schools, you know, emerged, well, I mean, many of them were not, uh, you know, public schools were not in the best position. They were not, you know, they didn't have the best faculty, the best programs and so on. So Catholic schools, as a matter of fact, you know, raised the bar, you know, and Catholic universities as they have evolved, you know, in general are very strong institutions. You know, we got very good name Catholic uh, institutions. And the second purpose of Catholic uh, educational institutions, you know, has been, you know, maintain the Catholic identity. I mean, it's just as simple as that. We, we, we wanna do things in a way that is truly Catholic. Now, the context in which Catholic schools and Catholic education in the US, you know, is, is done comparing, for instance, the end of the 19th century and early 20th century has changed dramatically, you know? I mean, for instance, we, we went from pretty much educating almost only Catholics to educating a growing number of non-Catholics, you know, non-Catholic Christians and even non-Christians. Uh, the sisters, you know, and the, and, the, and, the, and the brothers and priests who were omnipresent in these institutions are almost absent, you know. In half a century, we went from 97%, you know, mostly sisters and, and a few clergy, a few brothers, down to about one or two percent, you know, which is amazing. You know, the, the, and we have more lay women and men who have stepped up to the plate, you know, and uh, definitely with strong commitments to Catholicism, but in a different way, not just like, like, like the sisters. And so also that we see these days is, you know, our Catholic schools and universities compete, you know, with other institutions, you know, whether it's faith-based inst institutions or secular institutions, uh, in a marketplace that I want to call brutal, you know, I mean, it's like, if you don't compete, you are out of the game. And we already see this in Catholic schools. I mean, you know, in the 1970s, we used to have more than 13,000 Catholic schools. Today, we're down to the low 6,000s, you know, and unfortunately, we, we have lost uh, many of these schools. So I think that I want to provide these numbers, you know, because I think that, it, that in the midst of these changes, we need to ask ourselves, are we keeping our Catholic identity? I mean, are we doing Catholic school, Catholic university education with a Catholic view? No, and that requires asking important questions. For instance, you know, these days we're filling our schools with, you know, anybody who can come, you know, we want them to come to our schools. But the question is, does filling the schools with students from any way of life, you know, in many, and in many cases with students that, you know, are the ones who can afford Catholic education, you know, make our schools the most adequate places to learn uh, the Catholic tradition and, and, and actually uh, embody, you know, what, what it means to, uh, to be Catholic, you know? Or do we run the risk of relegating Catholic values to campus ministry or religion classes primarily so we can compete for funding, for prestige, you know? And let's be honest, you know, some of the best top-notch Protestant universities in this country actually went through that process long time ago, no, or not long, not long ago. And the, what was sacrificed in that process was precisely the religious identity. So I think that, you know, when our nation and our church are faced with critical conversations, conversations about immigration, race, poverty, life issues like abortion and war and the death penalty, one, Tends, you know, wants to look at graduates from Catholic education, and I mean Catholic schools and universities, to see how they engage in these conversations. And I gotta tell you, Michael, the more I move around and the more I listen to Catholic educators and engage, what, I, you know, what, what we get is a complex picture, you know? There are you know, many, many graduates from Catholic schools actually who have not received enough of the Catholic intellectual tradition that will help them to make value judgments, you know, that reflect the integrity of Catholicism, you know, and that's, that's a problem. There are many other graduates who present elements of political or philosophical ideology as Catholic, you know, and then we are cheapening what, what, what Catholic identity, even in, in situations when those elements actually contradict the larger Catholic tradition. 
I'm not going to blame Catholic schools here, and you know, I'm not going to say that there's a, that they are bad or Catholic universities are bad because are bad because I actually teach in one of them, and my children go to Catholic schools and so on, you know. But we need to, you know, keep in mind that Catholic school that Catholic schools and universities need to regularly look at their curriculum, you know, and their faculty and their administrators to assess how honestly they are educating for justice, for truth, and for discipleship in a Catholic way. I'll leave the question on, on, on Latinos and other groups you know, for, for, for the conversation forward because I want to connect it to what Molly was saying earlier. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, you gave us a lot to think about there connecting to our the deep history of these issues uh, in, the, in the United States. And I, I, want to, I want to turn now to Cecilia, uh, who's a professor of theology at Loyola Marymount University and she is, is known for her work in political theology and her work on behalf of the Latinx community. And, and Cecilia, I, I want to get back a little bit to talking about and thinking about the pandemic that we're, we're in. Uh, when I asked Molly that question about the crisis of the day, I want to ask you about the crisis of the day uh, in a different perspective. Um, you know, student, student and teacher of the New Testament, I think about, a lot about this word apocalypse, the Greek word apocalypse as a revelation, an unveiling, a pulling back and letting us see the truth. But we use the word apocalypse also as, as a word to, to capture a horror, maybe a horror that comes at a pivotal moment of time. And so we have this, this horrible crisis that stopped the regular flow of time in our lives and also has revealed a lot of painful truths about our society. Uh, prior to the pandemic, you wrote about some of these revelations. You, you wrote about, quote, revelations of corruption surrounding who has access to education. That's from one of your uh, columns for America Magazine. Uh, and recently you've spoken about how this pandemic has caused your own vocation as a theological educator to become more powerfully political. And so I'm, I'm hoping you can, you can invite us, we can invite you to tell us more about uh, what you mean about those convictions. Yes, thanks, Michael. Um, of course, exactly as you say, right, the pandemic is, it has just thrown light on inequities and corrupted systems that many of us had been writing about for a long time and agitating about. Uh, and the, I guess that the opportunity of this moment is that we have a lot more people paying attention. And, and that's a key, right? Even, even, even this moment right now, uh, I rarely get to be on a panel with two of my uh, fellow Latinx scholars. So that's just amazing in itself. Um, but, you know, I'm a theologian, so I go back to, to the theological implications of the question of education, because I, I think Catholic can't be a label. It has to be uh, a, uh, a, a following of the gospel, as we have heard Molly and Hossman talk about, that has particular content to it. So um, I'm just going to go through a, a, a few of these things uh, that I see as relating particularly to faith and education together. The, the first thing is, is that we can't be church without having the voices of all of God's people. And that means God's most marginalized people, God's most vulnerable people. And if our education is not intentional about making it possible for them to join the conversation, then we are not in any way embodying the gospel or even reflecting on the gospel because we don't have their voices within that right and so that goes to a second point which is education allows us to stop talking about other people and let them talk about themselves we need their stories we need their experiences we need what we call uh, lo cotidiano, what the daily moments of life are revealing of God's work in the world. If people are shut out from education, they can't in any way help us to see all of this, right? A third thing that we need to pay attention to is following the money. The um, present educational systems 
in the Western world, but really, let's just say globally, <laughs> are built upon the idea of creating permanent underclasses. We are dependent on having people whose educational level will force them to do manual labor, will force them to do what we're now calling essential work because they have no other options. And we're seeing it so painfully right now. I hear it from my students, you know, my dad is, is, is a driver uh, and he's taking, you know, a risk every single day. My mom works at a meat factory where there was a pandemic blow up, right? They don't get to sit behind the screen and have conversations, right? So how insidious is a system that's predicated on a permanent underclass? Well, how do we undo that system? We do undo it with education, right? Um, a, a, a fourth thing is that Catholic education cannot be synonymous with Catholic schools. Catholic education has to be about a way of being in the world that is predicated on radical love of neighbor. So for me, Catholic education means that we get involved in every facet politically that affects education in the local level, in our neighborhood, in, in, in our city, in our state, nationally and globally, right? As Catholic people who want to ensure that we're loving our neighbor. And so if, exactly as Molly said, if money is being siphoned off public schools, then that we cannot allow for that. If we have uh, schools that have been set up now as just private elite schools with a Catholic name, that is not Catholic education, right? So, so our involvement politically in ensuring that God's beloved people all have access to education as an intrinsic right has to be at the forefront of ever calling ourselves Catholic and putting education in that word, right? And, and so I, I know that I like to be particular, especially because when I teach my, my graduate uh, theology students, I have lots of teachers, community organizers, priests, sisters, etc. And so I say there, there are particular things that we can do. So for me, right, so this is where the political comes in, right? For me, access for undocumented students to education is primordial. And if you are anywhere uh, where you have a Catholic university or a Catholic high school, prod them to find out, do you have any scholarships set aside for undocumented students? Um, programs for students who are the first generation to go to school. Uh, in, in, in universities, what we call first to go, right? First gen. Are they adequately funded? Do they have the support that they need? That is caring for our neighbor. Programs that support masters and doctoral students that are coming from underserved communities. Right now, right here with three Catholic theologians here, you almost have like an incredible amount of people from the entire Catholic Latinx theologian uh, population of the United States, because there's so few of us. There's so few of us. So we need programs that are going to support us like the Hispanic Theological Initiative and other programs, and they need support to get students from that elementary classroom all the way to being sitting in, in, in a university setting and helping our community to be better at what we need to be better. And then we need to build up political alliances. We need to make alliances with all of the groups, with other faith communities, political communities, NGOs, all of the groups that are working on education and educational access and educational justice. Wow, <clears throat> thank you so much, Cecilia. Um, the, it's a really powerful exhortation uh, to look, you know, to not just look at our screens, to not just look at 
the words in Commonweal Magazine, but to look in our own communities um, and, 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 and seek out those ways that we can support the undocumented and, and increase access and be powerfully political. Um, thank you, and thank you so much. Um, I wanna to turn to our, our, last, our last panelist, uh, Elsie Miranda. Elsie Miranda is uh, Director of Accreditation for the Association of Theological Schools, um, uh, rounding out a career as a professor of, of practical theology at Barry University. And, and Elsie, uh, you have a different perspective, a different uh, view on the world of education than the rest of us do right now. And your position, it seems like you see, you'd see a very wide array of types of theological education uh, and also adult faith formation. Now, Catholics, we know, uh, are called to form their consciences. That's a word we hear a lot, a phrase we hear a lot from uh, official teaching. Form our consciences so that we might be prepared to live out our faith amid whatever circumstances may arise in life. And as Catholics mature to adulthood, uh, the old answers that we learned in a textbook uh, or from our eighth grade teacher um, or from a catechism, those answers can begin to fail us. And so I'm wondering if you could, if you could tell us in your words, how, how do you diagnose uh, this problem uh, of faith formation and a, and a maturity into Catholic education? Are there models of Catholic formation of conscience that that you think can transform us into mature students of Christ, mature disciples of Christ, and, and lay leaders of the church, which are, of course, increasingly needed. The unmute yourself there, Elsie. Yeah. Sorry, I thought I was being unmuted. Um, so thank you so much for that intro, and uh, it's a it's a pleasure and an honor to follow my esteemed colleagues. Um, I'd like to just acknowledge that I I my my worldview has changed dramatically since I started uh, work the uh, the work of accreditation, um, and and it's made me fundamentally um, much more aware and appreciative of my Catholic formation. Um, because I'm so often surrounded by those who are not Catholic. Um, so I'd like to touch back on some of the things that Hoffman and Cecilia have said. Um, relationship to uh, Catholic identity and Catholic formation. Um, so often I, I, I look at the catechetical models and the formation processes that um, Catholic churches have kind of imposed upon uh, a generation of, of young men and women um, and even adults using this catechetical model that, that, that tries to ingrain um, a person into this sense of who we are by virtue of what we believe. And this kind of intellectual assent to a way of being um, is good. Um, but I think it, it, in my experience, it has left us kind of um, somewhat disembodied. And we forget that our, 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 we come from an incarnational faith. We have uh, the, the gift of understanding that God's grace comes into the world uh, as a human being and that the emulation of Christ and the gospel is part of what we, we are aiming for when we, when we talk about formation in Catholic education. And in, in my experience, we've failed um, our community miserably because in some ways we, we detached the narrative of our tradition, like Cecilia was saying, what, how do we listen to the stories of faith in the here and now that connect to the narrative of the, of the gospel so that people can participate in the Christ event um, and not have it be uh, like a historical phenomenon um, that is disengaged from, from their daily life. And so I see that in some ways, the Protestants who focused so heavily on um, a scriptural formation, uh, they, they lack the, the ritual and the richness of, of you know, the, the, what, we, what we understand to be a sacramental faith. Um, so in some ways we're both impoverished and um, I don't know that, we're, that anyone is doing a really good job of engaging the imagination today to see how young men and women can be formed to, to integrate the, the tradition, the gospel narrative with, with action, to recognize that how we form 
our conscience is not, uh, I mean, in some ways, Catholic, you know, let's be honest, I think um, the formation of conscience in, in many ways in Catholic circles is, is like a, is like the good news nobody wants to talk about. Um, you know, people ask, well, what is a conscience? Uh, you know, I, let me go find out what father thinks or, you know, and that kind of old school clerical model for, um, for doing what is right and good and just and holy and merciful is not helping this community any longer. Um, I don't know if it ever did really, but um, if, if, if we go back to Gary Metzpez, uh, 16, you know, my, my, the way I, 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 I have rewritten that for, for, for an inclusive community is that in the depths of our conscience, a person detects a law that is not imposed upon us, but rather that it rises up within us, summoning us to love and to do what is good and to shun what is evil. God has written this law upon our hearts to obey this law is the very dignity of our humanity. And by this law, we shall be judged. And I think that in this particular historical moment, as Cecilia talks about, you know, the political implications of our faith, um, how we understand our responsibility to act uh, with a sense of uh, dignity, to love what is good and to do what is good, um, requires a, a, a faith formation that doesn't go looking for um, Father to tell us what is, what is right, but that it requires a depth of spirituality uh, where, where we learn to be, uh, to be one with God, that the sacrament of Eucharist is not something we just receive, but it's something that we're called to live. And in that, we learn that sometimes following the law that is imposed upon us might actually be a participation in what is evil and following the law that is in our heart is actually a call to prophetic justice which may indeed get us in trouble with father but fundamentally is what is calling us to to be um good and and in that i think is where where our sense of um justice and uh, formation for Catholic identity is rooted. And I time myself so my five minutes are up. <laughs> Thank you so much, Elsie. From, from the four panelists, we've heard about a wide array of the issues that face us. And I, and I know that <clears throat> each, of, each of us would have follow-up questions and comments to, to each, each of us on the screen. Uh, but we have many attendees here, uh, hundreds, and we have a lot of questions that have come in. And uh, I'd like to, to pose one of them to open to the panel. I think it's one that anyone might have a way, a way into to discussing. Uh, you know, as teachers, when we assess other teachers, we, we try not to focus on what the teacher did, right, or what the teacher is doing, but what the students are learning as a way of assessing the effectiveness of, of education. And if we think about Catholic education and Catholic formation in this way, uh, one of the, one of the, people in the chat asks about uh, the, the lack of basic understanding of Catholic social teaching that exists in, uh, in, in the Catholic pews and in Catholic schools. Uh, and so this person says that many of uh, his or her fellow boomer generation Catholics uh, seem to lack this basic understanding and, and is wondering how do we, do we, do we, do we improve on that? Some people call Catholic social teaching the best kept secret of the, of the Catholic church, right? And so I'm wondering if the, uh, from the four of you, uh, if you've had experience with attempting to, uh, to do this or, what, or is that how you see the problem? I'm just kind of want to throw it open to, to the panel. Well, for me, one of the hopes is that we broaden graduate education um, so that we have um, a lot of the people in lay leadership all, all around uh, our communities who will get a solid and, and good preparation, but we also need that in our curricula. And so, um, and we need to support the access to graduate education but I'm, I'm often struck by having uh, a deacon, for instance, who will uh, be uh, applying to our university and realizing that 
whatever uh, we can train him to be able to just really access uh, the richness of Catholic social teaching will have major repercussions uh, with all of the communities that he works with, that he preaches to. So I think uh, education again, and just making it as accessible as possible, inviting as many people as possible into it uh, is, is one way that we need to do this. If, if I could chime in uh, on this, uh, uh, I, I think that the question, Michael, uh, you know, uh, points to the dysfunctional separation that you know many Catholics have introduced or allowed ourselves to be introduced for us, you not know, taking separating uh, Catholic social teaching from the rest of the life of the church. I, I just it just doesn't fit in my head. When somebody says, you know, I'm a Catholic social uh, teaching person and I don't do liturgy. Or somebody says, I do Eucharistic adoration and I don't pay much attention to Catholic social teaching. And I'm thinking, at what point, you know, did, did we start separating the, these dynamics, you know? And, 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 and I wanna echo uh, uh, Cecilia's earlier comments on, you know, the universality of Catholic education, you know, you know everything needs to be Catholic. And I would say that the same applies to Catholic social teaching. I mean, if you believe in Christ, if you receive the Eucharist, if you are pro-life, if you do the Eucharistic adoration, for goodness sake, you gotta care about the immigrant, you gotta care about the poor, you gotta care about the mother who is single, you know? I mean, the, 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 how can you separate you know, the, the, those two? And I think that it's not that people don't understand what Catholic social teaching is about because it's, to be honest with you, it's very commonsensical. You know, you respect everybody. Everybody is a child of God. You respect the dignity. You affirm people. The question is that we allow ourselves to separate artificially what it means to be Catholic, you know, from our responsibility towards the other. Uh, thank you, and I'd like to add to that that in that separation, I think we we. <clears throat> Well, let me just say that um, Catholic theological formation, even from the beginning, is about safety and belonging, to use Maslow's categories. And, you know, that safety net is, uh, is you know, I think is where we, we receive this formation that is tradition-based. You know, this is where I belong. This is who, this is what has formed my uh, religious imagination. But the belonging piece, um, factors into our, 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 our sense of, you know, my identity as a Catholic is something that, uh, that I am obedient to, and my identity as a Catholic is something that I'm responsible for. And there are many people who would like to um, separate that and say, well, you know, I'm a good Catholic because I'm obedient. Um, but the, at the end of the day, the, the question is, how, how is, your, um, how is our, our Catholic faith measured by, by, the, by all the ways in which we take responsibility for living our faith and, and, and living that discipleship and calling out uh, one another to service and to see again that the poor and the crucified are right here in our midst. Some, several of the questions, Elsie, uh, that, I'm, that I'm seeing get, get to your your phrase, the, the clericalist default, the, the idea that people turn to, you know, turn to Father for, for answers to these questions. And it, it strikes me that one of the issues that's bubbling up from under the surface of all of our comments is the, the role of the laity, the role of lay people in, in Catholic education at, at all levels. And, you know, Hossman, you gave us statistics about 97% of the educators were sisters and, and in some case brothers and priests, and it's down to just a couple percent. And those of us at the, at the level of higher ed, of, of course, experience this as well. So I'm wondering, from, from all of our different contexts, how, what are some ideas, that do, we, do we have any ideas uh, how to change that perspective in Catholic education, the default to, to clergy, the default um, to, to priests and nuns? What are our strategies for how to, how to manage that? I know that's a difficult question. And, and maybe the biggest question of Catholic identity in education, right? Um, but I'm wondering what what you see from your your different perspectives on this question of clericalism and, and lay leadership. Uh, 
I'll, I'd just like to say that um, we need the leadership of the church writ large to more uh, forthrightly empower and recognize the leadership of women in the church. And um, in some ways, the silence on that is deplorable uh, because it, you know, if we, if we do not have legitimized power as laity, men and women, um, people keep looking for that authority. Like what, what grants us authority to speak uh, as, as Catholics? It's not because I wear a habit. It's not because I don't have a collar. You know, it's because of the integrity of our lives. And we have to have the imagination, the Catholic imagination has to be expanded to recognize the authority that is in men and women who have lived faith and who call one another to that, to living out that sense of discipleship. And, and you know what, um, when you look at the, the success that Bishop Barron has and EWTN, you know, a lot of that is because they have learned how to use the media. They have learned how to use, uh, you know, cartoons, programming, uh, uh, movies, different, different ways of packaging the message and inspiring young men and women. And, and the alternative to that kind of dogmatic faith in using that medium is not, hasn't been um, successful. We haven't done enough in that arena. And I think that that's, a, that's an area for, for growth that we really need to take advantage of. And frankly, you know, I, I, I love Pope Francis. Um, but he needs to say something more about, you know, um, the power and responsibility of lay leaders. Well, that, and for me, that, that goes back to uh, having the tools. So when I have a, uh, a group of, of uh, students and we start learning how to uh, have critical engagement with the tradition, how to look at the, at, at the newspaper in one hand and, and the tradition in the other, how to address the moment. When we give them the tools, then they're ready to go out there as lay people and ask questions. And I am, I am a big proponent that we need to just be fearless. We need to uh, buttonhole uh, the priest or deacon who just gave a terrible homily, we, at the end of that, when people are shaking hands, we take them aside and say, what was that? And I have done that. What was that? What was that about? Because that, that was demeaning to women, because that was demeaning to the poor, right? But my, I want my students to feel that they have the authority and the capacity to go and ask those questions. And how do we do that? Well, I, I teach them to gather the evidence. You need to know your tradition. You need to know your scripture. You need to know how to call them to task on what was just said, which is why for me and, and for great thinkers like Paul Ricoeur being way before, education is the key to liberation. And the laity needs liberating. We need liberating out of this thumb and women especially, we need to be able to say, no, you don't get to say that. And the only way that happens is with education. If I, if I, I could build, oh, oh yeah, Molly, please. I just wanted to say um, on, the, on the subject of women, especially in leadership, for me, Catholic grade school was and is a place where I, see that lived out. And, you know, it was because I went to a Catholic school where a lot of the teachers and the administrators were sisters and lay women. And my four sons now go to a school where leadership is almost entirely women and lay women. Um, that feels really important to me. And that's, that's how I knew that women could and did claim authority and claim leadership and fulfill leadership roles in the church even when the hierarchy was saying, well, not so much. I mean, I knew different because I saw it from the time I was a little kid. Um, so that's something I really value about, about, especially at the elementary level, Catholic schools, is it's a place where, where women, in, including the moms, are, are really just doing the work. Um, if, I, if I could pivot based on something Cecilia said, um, it connects to one of the questions that uh, I, f I find pretty fascinating here in the chat. So 
here in the pandemic, most of our children are not learning in a regular way, whatever school they're going to, right? And many of them are learning in small groups. The learning pods is this something that's, that's been called. And so one of the one of the attendees asks, when we're when we're talking about reimagining Catholic education at, at all levels here, is it possible that we can think of small Christian community models, right? Think about you know, in, in Latin American theology, based communities where this education for liberating praxis happens. And of course, in our Protestant sisters and brothers have a, a whole history of educating in small groups and small group faith formation uh, that, that at least American Catholics have not uh, usually been on board, on board with, or it's not a part of the culture, uh, at least not yet. Um, thinking about the pandemic plus that history, again, throwing it up, open to the whole panel, um, do you think that small Christian communities within the Catholic Church, small group learning pods of faith formation, does this have, is this one part of our future? Um, how do you, how do you all see that? I, I would just, I'll be brief. I, I would love to see that happen. But I think that the Catholic Church has to get over the sexualized uh, focus of our of our of our formation, you know that 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 kind of disembodies people uh, as you know good and evil based on some kind of sexual paradigm, and and really look more at the issue of power and authority and 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 how we live into a, a that kind of kind of graced existence, um, and and that'll take some some undoing, um, but I think it's possible, and and if that happens, then I think a base community would really be. A beautiful model. If I can chime in on this, uh, I think it's already happening. You know, what, what you're describing is already happening. Just look at the Latino communities, look at Asian communities, uh, Black communities, Caribbean communities. We already see this, uh, this type of education is it, happening. What the problem is that it's being ignored, you know, because it's not mainstream, you know, and uh, very rarely what the energy of the Latino community makes it into a Catholic school or a Catholic university or makes it into the standard of how a diocese actually organizes religious education or a diocese organizes Catholic, uh, Catholic schools, no? And as a matter of fact, it's expected that Latinos and Asians and Black uh, communities, African-American communities actually adjust to whatever standard models are, you know, that are not working, you know, I mean, it's just, we have to be honest, you know, uh, I'm, you know, openly critical about the K through 12 model for, for catechesis, you know, it's not working, it's been many years in which the system has been faltering, you know, I mean, there are places where they do it well, congratulations, but in most places it's not working, it, 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 that is not simply working. So, yes, I mean, it's already happening. Um, my, my fear is that in an individualistic society like ours, you know, uh, those models that, you know, emerged in Latin America based communities, small ecclesial communities, you know, they require a communal perspective and understanding of faith and, and society. And that's going to be resisted. I mean, period, it's going gonna, it, gonna to be resisted. And the last thing that I, that I want to say you know, uh, perhaps, you know, some of my colleagues on this panel might disagree about, you know, uh, or, or may have different perspectives, but I see a lot of value in ecclesial movements, you know, I, there, there, are, there, there are the apostolic movements, you know, when run well, you know, when done well, there's a lot of energy and they are doing a catechesis and, and Catholic education that is fascinating. My critique might be perhaps sometimes when they get co-opted by, you know, small agendas, you know, but that happens pretty much to every group. But there is energy there. Yeah, the thing that I would add is that we we want to uh, always keep an eye on education also, and not just faith formation. Because, I, you know, I've I've been part of a fantastically beautiful small based communities, and very often what I hear from the community members that. The, the Latino community members is, I, I never got to go to school. Can you teach me how I read this? Can you help me, right? And, and, and I, I don't want us to, to con uh, small-based communities to continue to bifurcate people who have skills 
from those who will talk about their faith. Uh, we need to integrate those so that the small base community, which is what I, I wanted to do with this community, was building up leadership from them. And for them to be able to build up leadership, we need to give them access to the education that everybody up at the top gets, right? But they're not supposed to need because they can just share Bible passages. I, we really need to be very vigilant about that. So uh, I, I see that we're coming, unfortunately, short, uh, short of time here up to the end. And with just a few minutes left, uh, I, I would like to give each of the panelists a chance to, to, to give a closing thought, a closing word, a word of exhortation or an observation based on, based on our hour together. Uh, I'm, I often tell my students that one of the goals of a liberal arts education is to, to be able to say, anything you want to say in any amount of time that you're given, right? So that if you can do it in one sentence or you can do it in one hour, but to try to, to, try to boil down your ideas. It's idealistic, I know, but we, we aim for it, I think, as educators. And so I'd like to go in order, maybe the way we started uh, with Molly and, and then to Hoffman and, and around. But we've covered so many issues today. We've I've heard about um, accessibility to education, community formation, the, the challenges of Catholic assimilation to the surrounding culture and whether the distinctiveness of identity is there to be passed on, concerns about the very practical nature, practical issues of closures of schools and how that's affected Catholic education. We've heard about uh, education as a ministry. A disciple, of course, uh, means student after all, the, this term, discipleship uh, means to be a good student. Um, we've heard about the very powerfully political aspects of education today and what the pandemic has revealed about the fault lines in American society and the challenges in the church for those who are uh, kept to the margins, sometimes intentionally kept to the margins, and that only a radical love of neighbor can, can bring us back to our true Catholic identity. Uh, so I want to uh, just thank everyone for all of those comments and, and ask if you could leave us with a final final thought or exhortation about Catholic education today? Maybe first to Molly. Um, so the talk about um, clericalism and about leadership, I guess, is what I'm, I'm left thinking about. And um, I think because there are fewer priests than there were, you know, even when we were all young and because um, the school models are changing. So this school my kids go to is technically a regional school. So it's on the grounds of a parish, but it's not just funded by that parish. I feel like the, the authority of father as being overall is already receding in a way that I think is healthy. Um, and so I hope that my kids will leave their Catholic education at whatever point that ends. Um, conversant in the traditions and that feeling of comfort and belonging, you know, they know the prayers and they know how to say grace in a group of Catholics, but also feeling that they have an ability to discern and to understand and to take those tools and, and make decisions and not just um, to follow directions and, and defer to whoever the, the closest priest is when they have a decision to make. So if Catholic schools are giving kids those tools at whatever age and whatever level, I think that they're doing something really important and valuable. Uh, I'm gonna use my you know, few seconds to share three statistics. And from there, I will connect them to a pending thought that you know, was left at the beginning of the conversation raised by Molly. 60% um, of uh, about 60% of uh, Catholics who are school age in the United States of America are Hispanic. We know that 94% of Hispanic children go to Catholics, uh, go to public schools. More than 70% of Hispanic Catholic children go to underperforming Catholics, uh, underperforming public schools. So what I wanna say with these three numbers is that advocating for public schools is a must for every Catholic today if we care about the future of Catholic children and their families and the future of the, of the church. It's a, it's a non-negotiable. Absolutely, Hoffman. And I, I just wanna do an exhortation. 
get out of your spaces, get to know people who are different from you, uh, let their needs send you out to change the stuff that needs to change. And um, I would like to close with the, with the invitation to really learn to listen and really learn to see and really learn to be faithful so that that law that is written upon our hearts, not imposed upon, but given to us by God is something that not only forms us to be better human beings for one another, <clears throat> but for the planet. And um, I, I do hope and pray that in the context of our own lives that we might say yes with courage to the call of God. Amen. <laughs> Thank you so much to Elsie, to Cecilia, to Hossman, to Molly. Uh, of course, none of this would be possible without the readers of Commonweal and Commonweal Associates. So we're grateful to them as well. To our honorees, uh, Carrie and Amy, thank you so much. And please, uh, if you enjoyed this conversation, both the exhortations, but also the very deep challenges, that is the experience of being a Commonweal reader and being a Commonweal participant is that we feel uplifted on one page and challenged uh, on the next uh, to live out our faith uh, more powerfully and more locally. So if you liked what you heard, uh, or if you felt challenged by what you heard, hopefully both, uh, you can tune in uh, to two more of these sessions coming up. And thank you so much for being here. <laughs>